So uh, I've been working on this for, for quite some time, and, and the origins of it uh, actually originated uh, with a, a sliding block puzzle that I, that I did. When I first moved here, I brought a sliding block puzzle with me, and I sat and played it for a while. And, and then I thought, what, what kind of mathematics would uh, cover the solution of this sliding <coughs> block puzzle? Is it, it seems mathematical, but it's not clearly mathematical. It's not algebra, it's not uh, geometry. Um, it took me a little while to realize that, that it's actually uh, graphy is the underlying mathematical structure for sliding block, block puzzles and many other types of puzzles. Uh, there's, a, there's a mathematical theory called graph theory. And uh, what I'm imagining are, are nodes of a graph, the positions, dots on a graph being states, states of the puzzle, so states of the sliding block puzzle, states of any puzzle. And then allowable moves allow you to connect two, two nodes together with, a, with an edge as we say in graph theory. And, and, uh, and then once you've got that, that mathematical structure, you've abstracted away the, the puzzle, and you can look at the, the graph structure and then try to figure out what can I learn just from looking at this graph structure. So that's, uh, that's sort of the origin of this. And, and I've applied it to numerous puzzles, and now I'm trying to apply it to, uh, to word puzzles in indigenous languages. And I'll mention some of the particular issues about those in a little while. But, uh, <clears throat> I, I, it, this, this work uh, fits within the context of mathematics, graph theory, recreational mathematics perhaps, uh, but it also fits within the context of what I'm calling indigenous mathematics. And there really is a well-defined branch of, of uh, knowledge called indigenous mathematics. We're, we're making it up as we go along. But uh, uh, here, here are some of the examples of what indigenous mathematics means. Uh, so ethnomathematics, is the study of mathematics of indigenous people around the world. What kind of mathematical and math-like thinking do, do indigenous people engage in? And so there are very interesting examples of ethnomathematics in my culture and, and other indigenous cultures. Uh, there's a game that we play called the Peach, peach Stone Bowl game. We uh, have a bowl with six peach stones. The stones are smoked on one side, so they're white and black. And you, you put them in the bowl, and you shake the bowl up, and you toss it around, and then you count how many white versus how many black you get. Uh, if you get a lot of black or a lot of white, you get a big payoff. And we have all these beans and use as payoff. And if you get a if you get a mix, you sort of even three three white, three black, you don't get any payoff at all, or a very very small payoff depending on where the game is played and so on. Uh, so uh, this this uh, particular game has been analyzed in a book called Ethno Mathematics by a woman named Marcia Asher. So that's one example of, of ethno mathematics. Uh, the question is how do people arrive at the rules of the game, and uh, uh, was there a mathematical thinking that went into the, deciding what the rules of the game should be? The letter mathematics includes uh, uh, counting, measuring, locating, designing, playing, and explaining is usually how it's broken down. There's six kinds of math-like thinking that, that uh, ethnomathematicians mathematicians are investigating. So that's, that's an interest of mine. <clears throat> Another one is modern mathematics education. So, uh, when we teach mathematics to indigenous people, do we need to modify math in, in a certain way? Are there special approaches? Are there a special s subject matter that we, should, that we should consider when we teach math to indigenous people? And that's a, a really important topic right now. Our education systems are not doing a great job at, uh, at uh, teaching uh, uh, our uh, young people, our high school age kids in particular about mathematics and that leads to all kinds of other problems uh, difficulty in uh, finding employment or getting into universities or whatever. So, so that's another uh, important area. And distinct from those uh, is the application of mathematics to uh, areas of interest to, to indigenous people. And <clears throat> you know, that this, the question is, I guess you could phrase it this way, what, uh, what good is mathematics? And this is a question a lot of people ask me. Why do we need to learn this stuff? Is it, what is the value of it? And that is really an excellent question. I like that question. And uh, part of my answer to that question is to try to find examples of, of uh, problems, areas of interest to indigenous people uh, to which mathematics can be applied, to which mathematics can, uh, can uh, help us uh, enlighten us, provide answers, uh, and so on. And that's where my, my talk uh, takes off in that, that place. So this is actually, a, uh, <clears throat> I think, a, a rather new <coughs> um, way of thinking about mathematics and indigenous people together. 
not just as a problem, not just as a difficulty, like how why are these people learning math, but uh, as a, as a uh, in a more positive sense. What what is the true benefit of mathematics to indigenous people? So I want to show you some mathematics and show you how it might be able might might actually benefit benefit us. So so word puzzles uh, uh, is what I'm talking about here, and and uh, there's uh, three kinds of word puzzles that uh, that I want to. I want to uh, look closely at uh, one called word ladders, and I'll explain what I mean by that. There's, there's word searches, and we're all familiar with word searches. We've got a grid of letters, and you try to find words in that grid. And a crossword puzzles. And, and I think most of you are familiar with crossword puzzles. You've got an empty grid, you fill in, fill in the words based on clues. So those are the three kinds of puzzles that I want to talk about today. Um, the uh, the uh, other features of, of this investigation, the use of mathematical concepts and methods. I mentioned graph theory. That's the major uh, mathematical uh, framework for, for this. And, and graph theory provides us enlightenment that simply the use of computers doesn't. I mean, we can always throw computer power at something, but really having a mathematical framework gives us the enlightenment to allow us to uh, put the computer power to best use. So, so those are three features, computer power, the use of graph theory, or math, other mathematical techniques and methods. and. Uh, we, we are uh, generating particular kinds of word puzzles, uh, although these methods um, can certainly be applied to many other different kinds of word puzzles. Right, so, uh, <coughs> so, so here I'm going to provide you with an example of a, of a word puzzle. So change dog to cat. So this isn't biology, we're not changing the dog into the cat. This is, uh, uh, we're, we're changing the words dog to the word cat. Now the rule is we change one letter at a time. Uh, the number of letters is going to stay the same. Uh, uh, in one letter, we can modify that letter to any other letter in the alphabet. Uh, so if you, you know, this is a very easy one. This is a simple word ladder. You might, uh, actually there are a couple different solutions I can think of. Um, but I'll give you, I'll give you uh, uh, one a solution there. I, I changed dog to dot, so I changed the final G to a T. I left the other letters uh, identical. And then I changed dot to cot. And, uh, and then call it the cat. So each, at each step, I've changed one letter. Now, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, in this case, there's three letters. We've changed three, uh, three letters in, uh, in three positions. That's not a necessary feature of this puzzle. Sometimes you change the letter in a certain position multiple times. Sometimes you don't change the letter in some position. Uh, sometimes you have to change into an intermediate word that seems totally unrelated. So. Uh, uh, you know, this is just a very simple example of a word ladder. Uh, word ladders originally appeared in the late 1800s. Their uh, design, the puzzle was invented and designed by Lewis Carroll. Uh, and he called it doublets. So you may see it under the term doublets if you do a Google search for, for, this, for this type of puzzle. It was very popular in, uh, I forget the name of the magazine, but there's a magazine that published Lewis Carroll's doublets for, for decades in, in the late 1800s. You still see, occasionally see them. They're not uh, so popular now, but uh, uh, you can still find them in puzzle, puzzle books and magazines. All right, so uh, in, order, in order for us to uh, not just solve a puzzle, but also design a puzzle, uh, it actually uh, is, is important for us to have a dictionary. A list of words. Of, I, I, this isn't really a dictionary. I, I mean, there's all kinds of technical terms. Dictionary versus word list versus gloss versus blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is just a word list. I should have called it a word list, not a dictionary. Uh, so what I've done here is list a whole bunch of three-letter words. Now, it should be clear from the rules for doublets that I, or word ladders that I can't change from a three-letter to four-letter word. So, so if I'm just talking about three-letter words, I can, I can just stay within the domain of three-letter words. And here's a word list. <coughs> I, uh, I just sort of pick these words at random. They're not, uh, there's, they're, there's nothing special. But we can imagine, say, we have a dictionary. And this is our complete list of three-letter words in English. It's not, but we're, we're just pretending for the time being that this is our, our, our word list in English. Now, I want to generate uh, uh, these word ladder puzzles. So uh, uh, I'm going to introduce a sort of uh, very simple mathematical concept, the Hamming distance between two words. Uh, the Hamming distance is something that comes up in coding, coding theory. Uh, and and uh, um, you know, there's, there's this 
question about phone numbers. So we have seven digit phone numbers. I guess we have 10 digit phone numbers now. We have phone numbers. And uh, we, we um, uh, if we make an error in a single digit, we dial the wrong number, and we actually may get another person. And you know, we end up having a conversation. If there's somebody at the other end with the same name as the person we're looking for, then we get into a big discussion. So it's, it's unfortunate uh, if that happens. But there's a way to design the phone number system so that a one-digit error will not get you another person. And that's, that, that's to sort of find an area around your phone number which is not used. And uh, that area around your phone number which is not used, if, if, if it's one digit that will change, we say that those, those, uh, uh, all those phone numbers around your phone number have a having distance of one. That means I've, I've changed it in one, one place. So dog to cog is one because I've only changed one letter. But on the other hand, uh, dog to dip is two, the having distance is two, because I have to change two letters to get from dog to dip. And then from dog to cat is three, because I have to change three letters to get from dog to cat. Now, what I'm really interested in here is words with having distance one. I just want uh, to, to know how I change one letter uh, to get from one word to another. So I, uh, what I do is I, I um, take all the words of a dictionary, and just for the purposes of this talk, I've chosen that small dictionary, but it works with the big dictionary. Uh, uh, you know, it's just that it's hard for us to visualize the big dictionary, so I just take that subset of the small dictionary. We join the words with a line, technically an edge and a graph, if and only if their handling distance is one. And then uh, we, uh, we analyze the resulting graph. So here's a, here's a picture of what, what we get. So it's a little bit blurry, maybe, because I crammed so many words in here, but you see, uh, I, I, uh, you know, car is connected to ear because I changed the C to an E and I, uh, and I you know, can change one letter and get from one word to the next. Car to caw, uh, the, the sound of crow makes by changing the R to a W. Car to can by changing the R to an N. And that's, that's it for car. I can't connect car to any other word in this dictionary by changing one letter. And I do that for every word in the dictionary. Check what it connects to. Uh, this is fairly tedious to do by hand. With a computer, it goes like that. It's almost instantaneous once you've written the program. And once you've written the program, it works for English, it works for this dictionary, it works for this dictionary, it works for Cree, it works for every language. So, uh, you know, you save an awful lot of effort in the long run by writing computer programs to do these things. So, uh, um, there is the complete graph, all the different possible connections. And, and uh, now, uh, this may not, you know, it may seem, uh, you may question the value of this exercise, but, but uh, it, it, it now answers completely the question of uh, how do I solve a word ladder and how do I construct a word ladder? Both of those questions now are completely answered by this. So, for example, if I want to connect uh, cow to buy, I, I see a path. You can visualize it. I go from cow to row, row to row as in caviar, uh, row to rye, and rye to buy. So uh, if you can visualize, a, if you can see in, in this graph a path between two words, you can, you can construct a word ladder puzzle. Or conversely, solve a word ladder puzzle. So this is a complete solution to the problem of word ladder. Um, well, what happens in practice, this, this graph is nice because it's connected, what happens in practice is you get islands, you get uh, what we call uh, disconnected components, meaning you can't get there from here. Uh, and that, in that case, there's no solution. So, so uh, this uh, analysis will uh, show for us if we do have uh, uh, those disconnected components or those islands, it'll tell us that we can't get there from here, and so we can save, you know, save ourselves the effort of actually trying to construct or solve the puzzle. Um, uh, and we, you know, we'll, we'll see. Um, uh, another issue is one of finding the, uh, the, the shortest path. How do we find the shortest path between two? So you want the optimal solution, maybe. Not just a solution, but the shortest path between two words. And uh, so, you know, if we look back at the graph and we tried to connect a go to new, uh, the answer, you know, this is an, an answer, but I can also guarantee that it's the shortest path. 
And I can do that with something called the shortest path algorithm. So this is something sort of in graph theory and computer science. It's an algorithm or a step-by-step -step procedure that always gives us the correct answer for finding the shortest distance between two places in the graph. Uh, now you can go back to the graph and eyeball it up and see, and see that it is the shortest path or try to figure out why. But, but actually, it's, if we do a little bit of mathematical thinking, um, we can, um, we can save ourselves you know, the effort of, of puzzling and wondering about it. So uh, where does it go in this graph? It's down here. A go is down here. New is over here. What I do is I start with a go and I say, okay, where can I get in one step from a go? Well, I put the number one at a do and I put the number one at age. Now, uh, in a go, I have a zero. It's, uh, I, I take zero steps to go from a go to a go. Okay, now uh, uh, every place that I could get with a one, I then say, well, where can I further get? Can I get to a place that I haven't been before? Well, you know, I can get to the word add by an additional step. So that would be two. I would put the number two on add. And I can get to age in two. And then I can get to R in three, I in three, eight in three, and so on and so on. So I put numbers all over the place in this graph. And uh, if you think about it, each number is guaranteed to be the minimum number of steps to get from a go to where, I'm, where, I'm, where, where I put the number down. Eventually, because this graph is connected, I will flood the whole graph. I will get to the word now. And that tells me exactly how many steps it takes to get to the word now. And then uh, um, I work backwards from now. I go now was say, I don't know, seven, I think. Uh, I look at where, where the number six is, and I hit the number six. And then I look at where the number five is. I'm guaranteed to move closer to my origin that way. And so I've worked backwards and found the starting point. Well, it's kind of hard to do you know, without the paper in front of you, but I've got uh, grade eight students to do this. It's really easy. It's very straightforward. Grade eight students can do it. Computer, computers can be programmed to do it. Not only can computers be programmed to do it, but there are just canned algorithms to do this. So, a library of algorithms. I don't have to write the program to do this. I just say, uh, uh, Dijkstra shortest path, and it, it'll, it'll find the shortest path between two, between two words. So that's um, uh, how, how I can use computers to find not only a path, but the shortest path between two words. Uh, so it takes a fraction of a second. Speed is an important thing when we talk about using computers to solve problems. We want things to go quickly. This is an example of linear time. So if the graph has uh, 10 nodes, it takes a certain amount of time. If the graph has 100 nodes, it takes 10 times as long. If the graph has 1,000 nodes, it takes 100 times as long. There's a linear relationship between the size of the graph and the uh, and the time to, to uh, execute the algorithm. And that's really good. That's about as good as it ever gets. You may get a little bit better in some algorithms, but that's pretty, pretty done. So, uh, so, you know, it just takes a fraction of a second, really no matter how big the dictionary. If I can load the dictionary into my computer, it'll run in a reasonable amount of time. Okay, now, uh, uh, next, uh, because of its familiarity, uh, I'm looking at the, uh, the problem of crosswords. So uh, here's an example of a crossword. This is a simple three by three crossword. But look at every word here is, is a word in my little reduced dictionary. Car, a go, a new, a cross, and down I've got can, age, and row. So I've got six words all jammed in this little grid. And, and uh, they, they all intersect nicely and so on. So this is an example of a simple three by three crossword. This is about as simple as it gets. Uh, uh, the, the, the question is, how do I automatically generate these, uh, these crossword puzzles? And this computer, it's the first time this has ever happened to me. I should have checked this. I, I assume that we, this computer does not have the correct font loader. Sorry. So uh, this, uh, this, uh, these should be syllabic characters. Three syllabic characters right here. Um, maybe, maybe I've got a handout that will demonstrate that. 
Anyway, um, I used a Cree dictionary, uh, different, of course, from the English dictionary I showed you before. Uh, these are three syllabic words in the Cree dictionary, and the dictionary was supplied to me by uh, Eric Wolfgang Gray, First Nations University. So he's got a very good electronic dictionary of Cree. Actually, I wrote the routine to go from the SRO, the Standard Roman Orthography, to syllabics. And uh, of course, words get much shorter when you put them in syllabics. So you know, I took this long list of words and I jammed them all down to three letters, or no, to syllabics. And then I took all the three letter syllabic words out of it. And I, I used a computer to generate the, uh, the, uh, the three by three crossword. So I've got a, I've got, a, and in the SRO, Standard Roman Orthography, I put the words in there. That you'd see the upside down, CK, recently in Tikema, of course, the three words that are supposed to appear. Uh, unfortunately, I did not get any crosswords that had different down from across. So I had, uh, I had uh, um, words with, uh, in English, you saw that the words were different down and across. In Cree, they, all the crossword puzzles were symmetrical. So all the down words were the same as the across words. So there's really only three words. I never did find a three by three syllabic dictionary, or sorry, syllabic uh, crossword puzzle with, that was not symmetric. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell a little bit more about the reasons for that later. So uh, uh, what, uh, I very quickly read over that. The mathematics is, is related, but more complex. So the mathematics, um, is uh, still graph theory, is the, is the big context. But the particular uh, mathematical uh, uh, algorithm to use to generate these is a very different algorithm. The algorithm is called, um, um, uh, well, the problem is called clique. So, so there's, you know, if we, if we uh, look in this room, who knows who? So I know you, I know you, you know, and I know you, and I know you, and I know you, I don't know you, I don't know you, etc. So, so we say, okay, do I know you, do I not know you? And if, if I know you, we're connected by an edge, and I assume that if you know me, I know you. And, you know. So, so we got an edge here, an edge here, an edge here. And so the three of us make something called a clique. We are all um, uh, mutually, uh, we mutually know each other. So pick any two people and, and you know each other. And actually, uh, I think if we, I don't know, who do we add? Who do you know? Okay, suppose, suppose you, okay, I know you. And so, so all four of us know each other, imagine that. Well, that's a bigger clique. That you know all three of us, you know the three others, you know the three others, and I know all three of you. So that would be a bigger clique. So uh, the problem for constructing word search puzzles turns out to be a mathematical problem called clique. And there are numerous algorithms to solve clique. But they boil down to all the same thing, sadly, which is try every possibility. And there is something called a combinatorial explosion. So the number of possibilities rises exponentially in relationship to the size of, of the dictionary, or the size of the puzzle. So the bigger the puzzle gets, the, uh, the uh, uh, say I, I make a four by four, well, it's going to take me twice as long. And if I make a five by five, it's going to take me four times as long. If I make a six by six, it's going to take me eight times as long. And that type of growth, that exponential growth, is, is bad news for computing. It means that uh, eventually we hit a spot where solving the problem is infeasible. It's possible in principle, but it's not feasible in terms of the resources that we have available. The computing power that we have, the amount of money that we have to buy computing power, the, uh, the memory available, whatever, all these resources that we have. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, at some point we're gonna hit a wall and, 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 and the puzzles are not gonna be solvable by computer or creatable by computer. Uh, with the Cree syllabics, my first attempt at it, just a kind of a thoughtless hack, you might say. Um, I hit that wall at 4x4. Four four. I had to shut my computer down at 4x4 four four, uh, 
three by three I could do uh, in, in a day or two. You could get a whole list of three by three, and I actually have about 35 three by three pre-slab or crossways. Four by four, I don't have a single one. I had to shut the thing down because it was just running and running and running and running. Uh, and that was a thoughtless way of solving the problem. Now, now we, can, we can play tricks, we can cut away possibilities, and, uh, and maybe sort of rig it up so that we can do four, four by four. But then we're going to hit a problem with five by five. So, you know, it, it's, it's uh, unfortunate uh, that we're, you know, if, if, unless we're very clever about it, we end up hitting the limits of computing. How do human beings do this? Because human beings certainly do design crossword puzzles. Um, well, that's, I think, part of what I need to learn in order to, to make more progress in this. So crossword puzzles, I've, I've set aside for the time being. They're just being very, very difficult to, to develop and produce. Um, yeah, the mathematics is understood, but the algorithm uh, runs, very, it runs too slowly for it to be practical use. So we need, we need a slightly different approach. Word search is the same principle. Uh, it's it's uh, the same basic underlying mathematics. It's the mathematics of uh, clique. So if I, uh, you know, word, word, uh, word searches, you have intersecting words in the grid. And you, they may be intersecting, they may be side by side, whatever. But uh, if they intersect, or if they're side by side, they have to be compatible. They can't intersect in a letter that, that doesn't agree. And, and that sense, they're friends. So they know each other. These, these two words. And, and then we have to find a whole bunch of words that are all friendly, mutually friendly, all with each other. And so you see that's exactly the same problem as in, in designing crossword puzzles. It's, it's uh, from the, uh, uh, the phenotype. <laughs> the, the, the puzzle that's generated is different, a word search puzzle versus a, a, a crossword puzzle. But um, uh, the underlying mathematical structure is the same. And there, and there are some sense they're almost like inverse problems. One is uh, one, is one of, of um, uh, taking a bunch of existing words, the given word list, and jamming it into a grid. And the other is taking a grid and jamming words into the grid. So, so they're almost sort of inverses or dual problems. They're certainly related problems. And then when you look at the underlying mathematical structure, the quick structure underneath it, you see that they are uh, indeed very closely related. Uh, however, word searches have, a, have an advantage, and that's that we don't need a dictionary to, to generate word searches. To generate a, uh, generate a crossword puzzle, we need a dictionary. We need to say, okay, here's the entire list of allowable words. Now let's try to jam as many of these into the grid as we can. Uh, with a word search, you start with the word list. And so you don't have you don't have to work contend with the entire dictionary. You just have to contend with the word list, and, uh, and that that makes it in practical terms a little easier to manage. Uh, I have managed with uh, uh, the clique algorithm that I have uh, downloaded from the internet. So it's not it's not terribly sophisticated. Uh, I could you know if any of you are interested, I can do some technical details later. Uh, but it, it's based on some coloring graphs. Um, so there's this interesting technique that they use to try to cut down the number of possibilities to check. And uh, I just grabbed that off the internet. So I think Finland has written this click library. So I grabbed that off the internet. And I used a couple of clever modifications. And I managed to stuff about 50 words into a, a word search grid. So now I can automatically generate word searches. You give me 50 words in any language. I will give you back a word search puzzle about 15 minutes later. That's all it takes. So it's, you know, it's not like the sec fractions of a second in the word letters. It's now minutes or maybe hours, but it's still feasible with some tricks. So um, you know, it's not entirely straightforward, but but I managed to do it. And, and you know, this is part of the research that I have to do is to see uh, what more tricks I can find just to push it, just to push it a little further, and see how far I can push it, and so. So get it dry in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, so here is uh, here is uh, my my word search in Crete. I got words from again from Eric Wolverine. I just asked, can you send me a word list 
related words, thematically related, just, just to make it interesting. So he sent me ducks and geese words. Um, and what I've done here, um, uh, so just to play around with it, just to see what I could do, uh, I've included all the accented characters in Cree. So Cree, we use long, uh, markers on, on vowels to say whether they're long or short. So you can see, um, uh, uh, right here, I've got a macron over the E to represent a long vowel E. And here, CC, or CC, is uh, macrons over the I for, to, to, to uh, signify long. So that was one problem with commercial word search software that we could find, is that it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't uh, allow us to use accented characters. So actually, with modern software, and Unicode is a method for encoding, encoding all the characters in almost all the languages on Earth, uh, which is standard in most software nowadays. Uh, it was no problem at all. So it includes long vowels, syllabics, uh, dingbats, um, letters from any language that you can imagine, except maybe some very, very obscure languages or dead languages. Uh, so I can do whatever language in word search. Uh, I've also thrown in, just to see if I could do it, English and Cree in the same word search. So I put the Cree word and its English translation both in the word search. And then I have a Cree, it's not here, but I have a list of the Cree words and a list of the English words. And so there's really two games you can play. You can match the, the Cree word with the English translation and you can search for all the words English and Cree in the dictionary. I also put spaces in. so. Uh, so here's, here's a brown duck. Now, in most word search puzzles, you would see this all jammed together. Brown duck is one long word, but now I put the spaces in. Just, just out of interest. So, I mean, yeah, black duck, there's black duck. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, just, just, you know, spaces, uh, dashes. I may or may not want to include these when I generate the final version of the puzzle. I was just interested in what would happen if I did. And uh, um, uh, I also use lowercase characters. The, the, the reason being that uh, the standard for, for writing pre and Roman orthography, SRO, uses only lowercase. And so I put all lowercase in. Uh, whereas most word searches that you would find use uppercase characters. So you know, it's, it's different just because I played with it. Um, but uh, um, you know, I can make it look more like a standard English word search with uppercase no spaces. Or I can make it look whatever. Uh, I can change the shape of it so that it's circular or whatever. Uh, so, so there's a lot of possibility. I never really got very far. You know, it's just a programming issue to, to, to do the different shapes. I didn't get so far with that, but uh, um, you know, it's not really a big problem. Um, uh, the uh, uh, yeah, there's there's other features that I can I can add to this. So uh, one thing that I did work into this this software was the uh, option of only using certain directions. So if we use syllabics, uh, it, it actually doesn't look right if you read a syllabic word in reverse. It looks a bit weird. So, so uh, uh, th th there's th things about where the dot is supposed to appear in relationship to the character. It really doesn't make sense to read a Slavic word in reverse, so I can eliminate those. I can say, okay, never put a word in reverse in this. Never put it going up, going diagonally back, going <coughs> backwards across. Don't do that. So, so there, you know, being able to write your own software to do this has numerous advantages. You can you can tailor it. You don't have to you know take the can application and try to work around all the issues and constraints and bad choices that those programmers make. You, you write your own software. It, it took me a day to write this. So not really big deal. Okay, so uh, here's, here's the word list. Uh, and these are not translations across. Like This is just the two lists in alphabetical order. And then you, you've got a match, so your matches will go not directly across. So, not uh, base is a male male duck. If I understand correctly. No. 
tem música, os Amiens Cruz. Sisyphus is a captain. I learned a little bit of Creed while I was doing this today. But, but I've talked to people about this. Are you interested? You know, Creed teachers are, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, can you send me their work list right away? Like, uh, I, I still have a few bugs and kinks to work out in this, but, but I mean, it's essentially ready if anybody wants me to generate word search puzzles for them. I would be happy to do so in any language. Okay, so uh, so that's that's um, that's that's my short version of uh, of the talk.